Okay, uh, I'm sorry I will do this in English. I hope that's okay for everybody. Um, my Czech is no longer capable of, of uh, translating <laughs> academic ideas, so... Um, I don't know how familiar you are um, with outlaw motorcycle clubs and uh, the subculture. Um, and that's why I thought maybe in the beginning I give you a little bit of an idea about these clubs in the first place. because, um, And then we move to the topic of the talk. Um, so outlaw motorcycle clubs, as you might know, uh, started in the United States following the Second World War and were largely consisting in the beginning of World War veterans and, and people who used to be in the military and then they somehow lost purpose in their life so they joined the uh, outlaw motorcycle clubs um, and other mot and normal motorcycle clubs of course. And the mythology goes uh, like this, that uh, in 1947 in Hollister there was a, there was a big uh, motorcycle event where thousands of bikers came and uh, at some point uh, uh, the, uh, there was a group of course of the bikers who were more violent let's say than the other bikers and they made a little bit of fuss and, and of course and then this whole event was overblown in the media and the American Motorcycle Association back then is, uh, is said to have said which is not even possibly true that 99% of bikers are law obedient and 1% of bikers are these kind of criminals and crooks and so on so that was the way they tried to distance themselves from the 1% and that's why you see that outlaw motorcycle clubs today uh, everywhere uh, share the same same myth of origin and they all use this 1% uh, on their jackets and on their jewelry and so on so every single outlaw motorcycle club will also call itself 1% so let's say like any kind of a clan, when you want to think a bit anthropologically about it, uh, this is kind of the foundational myth for the whole subculture that then spread all over the world. So today you can say that, for instance, the Hells Angels, the most famous club, of course, in the world. Now they are in 55 countries in the world. They have even prospect countries like Namibia and, uh, and Uruguay and Ukraine. They are now today and they are in Russia and they are there, spread basically everywhere. And they have more than 444 charters at this moment or so. And so you can see that they have had a huge transnational expansion. And of course, they have become a problem to law enforcement and to governments worldwide. They label them a criminal organization. And you have, of course, other big clubs that are equally problematic, like the Bandidos and Gremium in Germany, and of course elsewhere, uh, or the Outlaws and so on. So uh, from the point of view of the state, of course, these are labeled as mafia-like organizations and so on. And this perspective is, of course, then fought against by the motorcycle clubs themselves who say, yes, we call ourselves outlaws, but in our meaning it means that we are maybe outside of the mainstream society, we have our own laws, but we still obey the laws of the state and so on, so the word outlaw should not be read as criminal, so they fight against the state and they have different ways of arguing against this kind of narrative that they are organized crime group and so on. And I mean, and of course they are more than an organized crime group because when you actually live, uh, talk with them and, and see how they live and so on, you can easily see that maybe the crime consists of yeah, maybe 3% of their daily life and, and there are many members who are not criminal as well. And, um, and so there is, more to, there is more to the subculture than just uh, criminality. But of course, uh, in the public media and so on, and the public representation of these clubs, they, they cast them as sole villains no? and, 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 and purely criminal, and there is nothing more to these people. And I think that you can see this kind of tendency even exaggerated due to identity politics where of course you insist on one feature as the defining feature of a person. It used to be so that when somebody was criminal you could still imagine him as a human being with the same rights, uh, human rights and civil rights or whatever, uh, whereas today when somebody is labeled a criminal, especially in the mediated discourse, now, everything that he says must, to be, or must be immediately dismissed as, as an uninteresting and so on. So, uh, so that is uh, uh, somehow a little introduction into what this uh, clubs are about and of course what interests me in particular 
is that these clubs are growing massively and over the last 20 years or so, especially over the times with neoliberal reforms, you have more and more working poor in Germany, you have like every fifth child in Germany lives in poverty and so on. So you have a lot of socioeconomic effects that of course drive uh, a drive lot of people into these kind of subcultures. Are those uh, gangs, street gangs or outlaw motorcycle clubs or the Turkish guys might have the boxing clubs and so on. But in any single case you have a massive increase of, of people who uh, who join these kind of organizations and of course uh, to a very large degree, it has to do with the socioeconomic um, system. To a large degree, it also has to do with what these clubs can offer to people. Of course, they offer brotherhood, they offer love to people who uh, might not come from perfect families. They offer a value system very clear, they offer an honor code, they offer, they offer of course, uh, access to both legal and illegal networks. Uh, and so on, and they, uh, they offer great support once you enter those networks. So for instance, when, I don't know, a lot of these guys die on the motorcycle, for instance, they have families. The wives might get money after the death because they collectively collect the money. They collect money, they do a lot of charity, for instance. No? So they would take care of the children who are ill and so on within the community. So we can see that, that, there is, uh, that, there's, that it's also a kind of an alternative social system parallel to the normal society. And uh, so they have a lot to offer precisely under such uh, neoliberal conditions, let's say. And uh, where a lot of people feel betrayed by the state and so on, and, and that's what enables them also to grow. Now, you can argue that there are many reasons, uh, and, and I look at all these different reasons why these cultures are growing in the last um, years. But one of those uh, reasons is also, I think, uh, aesthetic, which is more poetic, let's say. <laughs> but there is, uh, there is also some power to the aesthetic and the visual and so on. And what it can offer people when, uh, when they uh, identify with or when they try to uh, embody, you know, uh, this kind of aesthetics. What is interesting that all these uh, motorcycle clubs, the big, especially the big motorcycle clubs, they have supporters. And you have even organized support groups and like the 81 for the Hells Angels. And, and others, um, and of course they have, um, and, and then there is a lot of people who just go to these events organized because you have a lot of public events organized by outlaw biker clubs. So a lot of people go there and uh, and, and try to somehow participate and observe. So you have a great amount of kind of fans that always turn up for these events and, and somehow show their support, but at the same time keep at a distance from the, from the bikers themselves. And I think that this is a, also an interesting dynamic. What do, what do these people actually want by, by coming and watching these bikers? Like for instance, you have this funny uh, uh, ritual, like when you have, uh, when you have the, the big, um, whatever, the colon of, uh, like the convoy of bikes, <laughs> and they ride behind each other, and the people stand, you know, and they watch all these bikes pass by. They would always stretch their hand and they, and they would touch the biker, like touching the biker is the thing to do when you're, when, you're, when you're an observer, like why do you want to touch the biker? I mean, maybe it's a silly question, but there is something to, to it. No? So, so there is a certain desire to, of course, come into contact with the kind of uh, uh, prohibited, the transgressive, the, what, is, what is, of course, these guys, consciously even exaggerate the, the, way, the way they cast themselves as, vil as villains because, uh, of course, this, uh, there is a certain power to it. So in uh, what I want to talk about today, I want to uh, think uh, a bit about this uh, kind of power that aesthetics has. And, um, and of course, uh, the power to intimidate, but also this kind of power that both attracts and repulses. No? Because there is something absolutely repulsive for many people uh, when it comes to the bikers, but they still cannot look away. No? So there is this perverse pleasure always when you look at something that disgusts you, but you still want to keep looking. And, and, there, and of course, you can at some point also appropriate some of that uh, power for yourself. And uh, I think that uh, we can start with a nice quote from uh, Hunter Thompson, you might know as underground journalist in the US who has written this famous book on the Hells Angels. He writes in it, the streets of every city are thronged with men who would pay all the money they could 
put their hands on to be transformed, even for a day, into a hairy, hard-fisted brutes who walk over cops, extort free drinks from terrified bartenders, and thunder out of town on big motorcycles after raping the banker's daughter. Even people who think the angels should be put to sleep find it easy to identify with them. And I think that he touches upon an interesting problem of, of uh, what is it actually that these people have that we want to, that even normal people want to possess some, something of. No? Um, and I thought we can start with a movie. Uh, I don't know if you know the movie. I think it's from 67, Born Losers. It's not exactly uh, <laughs> the most brilliant movie, as most of these biker movies are kind of B-movies. But, but I think that there is a, a point in trying to um, analyze these things. Um, and of course, the movie starts with a very uh, classical scene, a bit modeled after this Hollister riot I told you about. Like a bunch of bikers arrive in a small town and, and they do their usual biker mayhem and, and then they, uh, I don't know, they throw around things and, and then they ride on the bikes very fast and they terrify the local population and so on. And, and, and of course the, they are the opposition, the direct like co total opposition to the middle class kind of morality of the, of the town folks in, in some small town in America. No? And uh, what I find that, um, and of course what is also interesting, I think a point to note here, that whenever we deal with these kind of uh, groups, no, they, they do it also for us, this kind of excessive show of primitivity. And you can notice this kind of phenomenon like pretty much everywhere in television. No? Like in Norway we have these uh, great uh, TV shows where, where, because Norway has a drinking culture <laughs> problem. <laughs> and so on the weekends the Norwegians get terribly, terribly wasted and so on. And and then, of course, the television and reality TV wants to make some money, so they go around and shoot how crazy these people really are who drink so much. But of course, in the moment you put the camera to shoot these people, they exaggerate. Now they will show you their naked buttocks and so on, and they will vomit in front of the camera and, and show how excessively they are, of course, what you want them to be. No? So whenever you have a primitive uh, uh, people who are considered primitive, they will even stage this primitivity for you. No? And I think that is that's something that very often happens in this dynamic also when it comes to these bikers and which is of course used cinematically as well um, and uh and of course, what is uh, what is interesting here that uh, that there are, there is a group of girls uh, like up there in these bikinis, nice girls watching uh, watching these bikers, you know, ride through the through the city and so on. And and one of these girls says like, don't they just give you the creeps? I think they are kind of cute, says the other one. I wonder if you hear about what what you hear about them is really true. And this, the last one says, oh, wouldn't it be neat to meet them just for once? No? So you have this kind of, uh, we know they are quite bad, we know they are the, they are, they are the thing that we should hate the most, being uh, you know, moral, middle class, uh, small town people, but at the same time we have a terrible desire to actually experience them in real life. Now, what is happening, what happens later in the movie is, of course, uh, the girls act on their desire and, and they refuse to just be pa passive observers and they go and see these guys. And, uh, and then they are all raped and uh, the, the bikers, of course, try to initiate them into becoming their mamas, like the girls shared by the whole club. And, and, and there you see the utmost difference between what you can label as a sublime experience, where you feel attracted and repulsed at the same time, you have a certain desire and you can take some kind of a pleasure in observing these bikers versus the real effects of real trauma. No? So, so the one girl down there would afterwards like not, uh, not talk at all, the one would just like lie in her bed sucking her thumb and so on. So they represented quite nicely this big difference between, between that. And except for the one that in the end it turns out that actually she enjoyed it and she did it as a rebellion against her silly middle class mother and so on. So she was actually not raped, but she was the only one. But I think what it nicely portrayed is precisely this difference between, between the sublime experience and the effects of real terror. No? So as long as, the, as long as that which terrorizes you is kept at a certain distance, you can enjoy it. The moment it comes too close, then, then you just become uh, a victim of, of, of that. No? Um, so, um, and I think that, of course, uh, what we can argue is that this kind of uh, sublime um, 
experience is one of the reasons why people are attracted to these clubs. There is something in the, in the aesthetic, in the way they present themselves, that attracts precisely based on this basis. And this is also why, in the, in, I think, in the, when, you, when you are in the field, people always keep a distance to them. No? Very few people are, uh, are going and really, really like engaging with them. They are always there to be observed. So you see a lot of people going to these, uh, to these parties, and at 10 o'clock they would say, OK, now it's time for me to go home. You know? Because after that, there, there is this big Hells Angel, and I heard that you know, he's a bouncer. And if you don't behave properly, he's going to beat you up. Of course, nothing happens. <laughs> Even even at three o'clock in the morning, still nothing has happened. But there is this idea that has to it, it works on the imaginary. No? So so you you have to produce this kind of notion that you are actually around threatening people, and now is the time to go. And and you have to play with this distance, and then you achieve a certain pleasure. Uh, and I think this is what uh, what attracts uh, people. And of course, maybe you know uh, Edmund Burke, who was uh, actually a conservative thinker. But even conservative thinkers have sometimes great ideas. And <laughs> And uh, he wrote in uh, 1757 uh, his philosophical inquiry into the origins of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful. And maybe uh, you, if you study art, you probably know this. And he nicely remarked that terror uh, is the common stock of everything that is sublime. So his definition of the sublime, of course, you might know the definition of the sublime very often in... in um, in uh, art history and so on, you think of the mountains and the nature that is beyond the person, like that is threatening to you, that makes you very little compared to it and so on, as some kind of sublime in, in the nature. But I think that Burke was smarter than that and, and he recognized that it is not only a phenomenon in the nature but also a phenomenon in a society and that is deeply, profoundly connected to notions of power. Um, and. Um, See, and, and he also has this uh, same observation when it comes to this, uh, this kind of importance of distance when it comes to the sublime. He remarks that when danger or pain press too nearly, they are incapable of giving any delight and are simply terrible. But at a certain distance and with certain modifications, they may be and they are delightful. So, um, um, see, and then again he says, terror is a passion which always produces delight when it does not press too closely. And of course, uh, there is also a certain play, and I think here also uh, with the bikers, where of course you play with death and potential death and potential self-destruction. When you face a person who is superior to you in power, who has a violent reputation and so on, you can, you can imagine that this person can totally destroy you in the same way the people quote like, you know, in the future, in the night, you know, it will become violent and there is this threat. So you always play with the, with the notion of threat and threat to, to the self and, and to self-destruction. Um, and of course, the delight comes uh, to a certain degree also from, uh, from this idea that you can incorporate that precisely that threatening element into yourself. And uh, for instance, uh, all the motorcycle clubs, when they have supporters, now they produce support merchandise. They produce uh, T-shirts and, and whatnot, you know. So as a supporter of Hells Angels, you cannot wear the Hells Angels or the logo because that's trademarked and that's sacred to them and that's protected by copyright and so on. But what you can wear is all these derivative items. It's a bit like luxury brands who have uh, uh, beautiful clothes only for the very rich, but then they sell you the perfumes. So in the same way, you can participate to a derivative object in the power of the, of the real um, object. Uh, and of course, uh, by that, uh, by, by buying these things and by wearing them, you can imaginatively, in a way, a bit of like a, a James Fraser would say, like a sympathetic magic principle, not the based on the principle of magic, I kind of, uh, some of the properties of that object stemming from those uh, mythologized bikers will transpose onto me and I will be also empowered. No? So the delight also stems from the fact that you can be empowered. Um, um. And of course, again, it, it relates to power, and I think Burke shows it nicely. I can give you another nice quote. Um, uh, he says, the, um, yeah, and of course, he says also nicely that this form of power that, the, that is grounded in the sublime aesthetic might be particularly seductive and attractive, attractive to young and inexperienced, which I find is nice because, of course, you see that the supporters are always young and <laughs> inexperienced and, and they, they, they see the world as something new. So he says, the power which arises from institution in kings and commanders 
has the same connection with terror. Sovereigns are frequently addressed with the title of dread majesty, at least in Shakespeare. And it may be observed that young persons little acquainted with the world and who have not been used to approach men in power are commonly struck with an awe which takes away the free use of their faculties. No? So in a way, they, they submit themselves to something they perceive as sovereign. And I think what is interesting, of course, is that, again, he, uh, he uses this notion of sovereignty here. And, and of course, there is something um, that is uh, interesting when it comes to um, sovereignty and the sublime and, and power. And of course, uh, it's only the people, like when you think of the notion of sovereignty, it's only the people who can kill, who decide over life and death. That's why the state is sovereign, because there's the monopoly on violence. So, uh, so the, the very thing that can decide over life and death is, is perceived as desirable for, for many people. I mean, for instance, you have a huge uh, cult of serial killers. No? I do know that like online you can, you can buy like stuff, uh, nails and murderabilia kind of, <laughs> all kind of hair cuttings from, uh, from famous murderers and so on. There is a big market for that. No? And again, it's based on the same principle. You want to possess some of that uh, sovereign power of that person who is, uh, uh, who is the killer. Uh, and of course, um, of course, what is also part of this strategy here uh, is, uh, is the kind of mystification that happens. No? That uh, you could argue that the more secretive a certain organization is, maybe like the mafia, the more it lends itself to be, uh, to be uh, imagined as something uh, that you both fear but you also desire. And so uh, Burke himself would argue that, uh, that, uh, that precisely this kind of secretiveness and so on is, is something that contributes to this mystical uh, power, let's say, or this, uh, this uh, aesthetics of power. Uh, but you could also argue, and I think, um, yeah, because he says, like, for instance, this I think find interesting, a great clearness helps but little towards affecting the passions as it is in some sort an enemy to all enthusiasms whatsoever. It is our ignorance of things that causes all our admiration and chiefly excites our passions. So to him, the more ignorant you are about a certain topic, the more likely you are to fall for it. But I think you could argue a different point as well, because uh, if you think of the way this kind of power works, um, it is clear that, uh, that it is an ideological formation. No? It is, not, it is not about knowledge. And if you separate knowledge from ideology, of course, like Althusser might have done and so on, then you realize that, uh, that uh, knowledge has little uh, power to break with ideology. So, um, for instance, like uh, Robert Fowler in his book on the pleasure principle in culture has, has reworked in depth this, uh, this idea by Octave Manoni, who, uh, who developed a thesis based on the principle that, uh, that, uh, that, that goes like this, uh, I know quite well, but still, which shows that you do a lot of things in your life which you know quite well might be silly, but you still do them. And of course, when it comes to ideology, what matters is it practice. So uh, what matters is, is actual practice. Um, and of course, uh, you can say, for instance, like, I know that horoscopes are absolutely silly. And, uh, and every horoscope uh, I read is, is probably written by some uh, whatever half unemployed woman somewhere. <laughs> and she knows definitely nothing about my future. But when I read this, I still take a certain pleasure in, in, in that. And, and it's precisely, it doesn't matter that you know, in a way. So, so the knowledge has no effect on an ideological formation. That's why it is so difficult to break away from ideology. Because, uh, for instance, all these kind of campaigns like of awareness raising. Yeah, okay, so we have raised awareness, now everybody knows. But ideology doesn't care that you know. It cares, or, or even worse, precisely because you know and you have this cynical distance towards the subject and you perceive yourself as enlightened and that you maybe know that you know oh there is slave labor somewhere in India that's how these clothes were made but you know I know it so I continue in my nice consumption and so on and precisely the cynical distance makes you fall uh, for the ideology no? 
So it's, it, you can also say, for instance, in this case, that, uh, that maybe all these people who go to, to these biker parties, it's not necessarily that they are seduced by a certain mythology produced by media or like these kind of uh, magazines from the 60s and 70s or something, and, and that they really believe that the bikers are these violent, bad, menacing creatures that are purely criminal. No, they know very well that those bikers are exactly like everybody else. They are very, very ordinary people who care about ordinary things and sometimes they are a bit bad no? and, and, and they stage themselves and they have this aesthetics of badness written all around about them and they are tattooed and they might not be pretty and so on but that, deep down you know that they are just normal people but still it works no? <laughs> so, so I think this is the, this is the precise uh, reversal no? um, and one girl even says that no? she says uh, uh, of course, I know they are like normal guys, but still, when you see them, there is a thrill. There is something. It is exciting to be around. No? And, and of course, uh, this, this thing happened to me as well, which I found very funny. Uh, once uh, I, I met the, the Californian Hells Angels, you know, and, and, in Oakland, and that's where they pretty much started. Uh, and and uh, they told me like we will meet you at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday, and I said okay. And then I was waiting, and then every hour they would send me a message like we we come an hour later and so on. And suddenly it was ten o'clock in the night, and and then they came and and in like a black old car and stopped at the red light, got out with these jackets, you know, looking very intimidating and so on. And they were like Teresa, and I'm like yes. And I tried to be nice, like give them a hand, but of course they wouldn't take it. And they're like get in the car. You know? And I was like, okay, <laughs> what can I do? I get in the car. And, and then, uh, <laughs> then we drove for a dinner and, and they were extremely polite, in fact. And we, we had a beautiful dinner and we discussed all kinds of like uh, museum related things because they want to make a house and just museum or whatever. And I was a museum creator. So they were like, we want your knowledge and so on. And, uh, and then they drove me back home and, uh, and, and, and before they said goodbye somehow, one of them said, so did you enjoy the, uh, the Angel's experience? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh yeah, the get in the car part, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. And then he had to kind of explain like, you know, this is what people want from us. We have to do this. This is our job. No? So we're like, we are an American brand and we are famous for being violent and intimidating. So we have to play this. No? <laughs> and I think that this was exactly uh, how this works. Now, in, in reality, they were absolutely nice, and and maybe they are not nice to uh, some other people, but <laughs> at least to me. But uh, but of course, uh, that's nice. And and I think that uh, there is also a nice point about the sublime experience, which shares um, a, a feature uh, of a threat, no? uh, like. A sublime experience actually like has the same structure as a threat because if you think about a threat, uh, like Mladen Dolar, a uh, Slovene philosopher, nicely pointed out, is the paradox when it comes to threat is in, in the fact that the potentiality as such, as such already works. It is actually while remaining a pure potentiality. No? So whenever you have a threat, the moment you stop, this is, this is the thing, the moment you stop, it's, it's no longer, and the moment you continue, it's no longer a threat. And that's what I find also funny uh, when it comes to, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these kind of um, um, short stories from like the 60s and 50s and some in the 70s, this kind of, um, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, um, features actually, uh, they're called features. And um, so whenever you see this kind of image, you can, you can see that there is never, a, you never see the, the actual uh, violence happening. You, every single image stops in the, in the, in the point of threat. No? There is, there is, there is never like a okay. They they bleed a little sometimes, but uh, but it's not anything major. Uh, but it's always the threat that is coming, and that's the moment of the absolute excitement and and kind of pleasure. So so the cultural pleasure even in this derives precisely from this uh, moment a little bit before. And and then when you read the stories, actually, I bought all those books like you can, <laughs> they're f absolutely fantastic. This kind of pulp uh, short stories. They're absolutely boring. Like the only fun thing about about these magazines are the images because they capture precisely the moment of the thrill, and then the real story is very like boring. Like a bunch of bikers came and then they did something violent and then somebody escaped and somebody died. And <laughs> end of story in a way. Like it doesn't have too much of a yeah. 
And of course, uh, you see also the way uh, I was talking about uh, here in these images, uh, where you have a juxtaposition of absolute brutality versus absolute innocence. And, and I find this, uh, this is also uh, fairly interesting when you think about, uh, even when you connect these kind of things, um, um, this kind of singularization no, that happens with everything that is kind of uh, threatening, you have the tendency to reduce the whole phenomenon to, to, the, to, to the singularity. Um, and, uh, and of course, so here you have the singularity of the, of the violent biker versus the utmost virginal teen girl who's, who's not only innocent, but she's also a virgin and she's absolutely beautiful and so on. And, 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 and then she's molested and so on. So you have this, uh, this, this absolute singularity on both sides. Now, what is, I think, interesting phenomenon when it comes to this kind of singularization is that you can observe it in any phenomenon that, that, that has some kind of sublime uh, tendencies. So, for instance, uh, there's a fellow who has written a book about the sublime and, and he pointed out um, the degree to which, uh, for instance, events like uh, the Holocaust or, or the nuclear bomb and so on are kind of sacralized and singularized as singular events in our, in our discourse. And that prevents us from understanding them because we can we no longer imagine them as part of our everyday life in a way. Uh, and to the contrary, we exaggerate and we, we focus on this one feature, this was the terrible thing. And the same thing happens also when it comes to groups of people. The same thing happens, for instance, with the Muslims who are cast as solid terrorists and so on. So it, it continues. This kind of logic is, of course, very present in, in any discourse. Um, uh, and of course, uh, what, what this uh, fellow writes is uh, uh, that the problem with singularity is that it aestheticizes, aestheticizes <laughs> violence, terror, and trauma while systematically casting it as incomprehensible. Um, it obscures rather than reveals the habits of thought and social structures that make any such practice inevitable. So for instance, of course, you, you're familiar with the work of Hannah Arendt no? that, that precisely goes the opposite direction. And she would say like, oh, it's in the everyday, the banality of evil in everyday practices of whatever bureaucracy and how the people submit. Or you have the work in Germany of uh, Harald Welter, um, who, who precisely writes about the absolute normality of, of the Nazis. No? Um, and so on, uh, they were just killed by doing a job like any other pr principally. And, and I think that th this is interesting because you can see this kind of logic of singularity that prevents uh, us from understanding this kind of phenomenon uh, uh, present in any debate, like in television debates, when you see debates with outlaw bikers versus journalists. No? You have this, uh, this idea that since he's a criminal, everything he says is irrelevant, and, and then we have the, the, good, uh, the good and the evil. And, and this is becoming, of course, because of uh, identity politics, I think a, a huge problem in society at large, like with this Me Too debate no, that we had now recently. You again have the same kind of singularization happening. So on one hand, you have the absolutely innocent, always truthful, never lying women who, uh, who whatever, are only victim and are very, very poor. And, and, you know, women were struggling for empowerment and to be tough and so on. And now they're like little rabbits that <laughs> whatever. And on the other hand, you have, uh, you have the absolutely uh, male sexual predator and so on. And most discussions go like that. And of course, you no longer distinguish bet between any structural violence, any and whatever, there is no longer any difference between like touching a knee and, and actually raping somebody and so on. But you have this very clear division of may, men are the predators and, and the women are, of course, uh, absolutely innocent. But if you look at, uh, for instance, like uh, very realistically on statistics on female, uh, uh, female uh, sexual uh, uh, offenders in the US, for instance, you can see that, uh, that women score pretty high, not as high as men, but very high in, in, in sexual offending. You have, uh, you have professors, female professors, who equally have, uh, have abused male students and so on. So, so it's a rather a question of power uh, that you should be looking at than a question of gender. But of course, gender becomes the, the, the one thing that suddenly dominates the whole thing. Uh, it's not that it's not important, but, but it dominates the whole field and it prevents any kind of understanding. And in that sense, it, it, it works precisely on the same principle as this kind of singularization of Holocaust, like the one event that can never repeat itself that was absolutely, utterly exceptional, while, um, again, this prevents the understanding. 
So, uh, uh, so you basically create this kind of anti-realist uh, anti sentiment, no? that of course lends itself to moralizing. So whenever you have a debate about, for instance, the outlaw bikers, it is only mora mora morali moralizing. And then you can say that it's moralizing without morals, because nobody knows. <laughs> so, so you only turn to morality instead of, instead of uh, any realist uh, analysis of the, of the phenomenon. Which is also interesting, and especially, I think, in anthropology, uh, when I sometimes present this kind of work, like at an anthropology seminar, uh, you have that problem, because uh, criminologists are used to this kind of talk about criminals, so they, they can take it fairly rationally. But when you present that to, uh, to an audience of anthropologists, the first question is always, how can you work with these sexist pigs, you know, and so on? <laughs> are they not horrible how they treat women, and so on? And, and of course, uh, again, this thing reduces the people to just one feature that is imagined to dominate their character for some reason. And, uh, and, and, it's, and of course, then it's also totally unthinkable to wor work with somebody that you might not like. I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to like people to, to write about them or to try to understand them and so on. No? But in a way, you, in anthropology especially, you're somehow bound to choose the innocent and the poor and the victimized and so on. And then you can write about them something nice and so on, and then everybody's happy. But if you write about right-wingers, for instance, in anthropology, like, it's like, how can you even talk to those people? And, and, and so, so this kind of uh, discourse, and I think it has to do with identity politics, uh, of course, uh, and this kind of singularization produces an effectual obstacle to knowledge. Because uh, if you have this, then how do you produce knowledge about the social world? World, if everything is grounded in this kind of moralizing, um, so um, oh yeah, and then of course you have all these movies who <laughs> contribute to this, um, and so we return a bit to the topic. Uh, and of course, uh, here you can see what I find quite nice with this one is that again you see this kind of monstrosity. Um, it is exaggerated, so it works with this kind of, you have several movies like that, even from recent times, which is called like, one is like Frankenstein created bikers, or then you have this one, I bought a vampire motorcycle, and then you have these werewolves on wheels, so you have also this kind of um, overlap of the monster and the biker, which is fairly interesting, which of course exaggerates these kind of uh, monstrous features. And, uh, and uh, here I would return a bit to the point about uh, sovereignty because I found that is uh, quite uh, interesting. And of course, there is a certain um, certain kind of uh, sovereignty that is con uh, contained in this idea that uh, that these guys can do whatever fuck they want, no? Because that's what people mostly don't. Most people uh, like go to work like eight to five, no? and so on, and somehow serve life rather than rather than let the life serve them. No? And this would be like what Georges Bataille, when he talks about sovereignty, he absolutely says like, sovereignty is when you demand basically something from life and, and not serve life. And, and this is, I think, also part of the reason why we take pleasure in these kind of characters as, as observers, even when they are in the cinema, because they, they refuse to serve life and they don't fear death. They just go and do whatever they want. And I think it's also funny because, uh, I don't know if you know that, like few people know that Georges Bataille has written one book which is called uh, The Trial of Gilles de Raiz. Uh, I don't know if you know, there is the... the, the uh, the blue beard, no? in the popular imaginary, the, it was the blue beard. There's like so, so many tales about this fellow from like uh, first half of 15th century, a guy who was a serial killer, and he killed a lot of small uh, babies, and then he even masturbated on them or what? And I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it says. <laughs> and, and, uh, and and of course, uh, this guy was absolutely excessive in in his killing sprees and so on. But it absolutely fascinated all the people. You know, throughout centuries, like in, in, in even when I was little, in fact, there's like so many reworkings of this of this kind of fairy tale, very brutal, of course, as a lot of fairy tales are that that uh, that I was read uh, when I was little. No? Uh, so so since like 15th century, this kind of myth survived and and is still popular. Um, and and it's funny the way uh, but I of course uh, using this notion of sovereignty talks about uh, this fellow. And he says, uh, generally the grandeur and above all the monstrosity of our um, character is imposing. 
There is a sort of majesty in his ease, one that he keeps even during the tears of confession. There is in the evidence of monstrosity a sovereign grandeur uh, which does not contradict the humility of the wretched man proclaiming the horror of crime. So even it, when he confesses, still, but I would insist that, that somehow he was, uh, he was a sovereign um, actor. And, uh, and, of course, uh, and of course, transgressive, absolutely. And, and this is precisely this kind of transgressive uh, uh, notion of sovereignty that, uh, that is also attractive. And of course, every transgression, whenever you have transgression, even the smallest one, uh, there is something bad about it. No? Like, uh, even if you take like, uh, whatever pleasures that you have in life, they always, uh, they always are things that, uh, that break away from the everyday, from the ordinary. So you have, for instance, um, like of course you can say it with a drink, you know, when I drink a drink of wine, like that would also, but I maybe say is the moment of the miraculous moment of sovereignty. In that moment, I somehow stop serving life, life serves me, I enjoy myself and so on. And there is of course something bad about it, your liver might go to hell and so on, but you don't care because you don't care about dying in that moment, you're not scared, you don't fear death, you just enjoy yourself and you live like there is no tomorrow. And the same thing you can see about like small pleasures, like for instance, taking a walk, no? like a walk is not when you go from point A to point B, but uh, taking a walk means you just waste time. So you always lose something, you always, there is something always bad in, in, in even the smallest pleasure that you have. And, and I think that, of course, these kind of characters just magnify this, uh, this quality uh, of, uh, of transgression in, in this uh, thing. No? Um, so. And of course, you can say that also, that's why we are attracted also to uh, books by uh, people like Marquis de Sade. No? This is absolutely the same, the same principle that you find also here. The only difference, of course, is that, that we are familiar with this phenomenon when it is mediated, when it's the movies, when it's whatever, uh, when it's pornography, it's kind of similar. Uh, but, uh, but when we're not, we're not so used to think, thinking about this when it comes to the real life. No? So when it comes to the real life, we, we don't imagine that actually people, people are also observers of other people who are transgressive in the very real life. And that it might be a reason why, why people are attracted to certain subcultures in that sense. Um, um, and this, uh, this also um, reminded me now, um, this kind of distance that is there, um, and that kind of desire. For instance, I don't know if you know that, but since the outlaw bikers are so popular, there's even like on Amazon, you can buy uh, loads of very cheap books, which are biker erotica. And uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like, uh, and there is even a subgenre which is like having a having a baby with a bike or not, like pregnancy pregnancy erotica. <laughs> and 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 at one party where I was, uh, there was a girl who came all the way, like to some other place in Germany where she was from. And she was an absolute reader of this biker erotica, but she has never met a real biker in her life, not a single one. And, and, uh, and then she spent all her money to, to travel to this uh, biker event because she, she thought, okay, I will for the first time meet these bikers. She was a bit poor character in a way. And, and then she did not even, she imagined, of course, that the whole party will go on until the very late morning and then she will just take the train back. But of course the party ended around two o'clock. <laughs> she, she didn't have a place to stay and so we tried to find a place to stay for her and so on. And, uh, and then she told me like, but, but Teresa, you, you're, not, you're not supposed to be talking to these people, you know? So she had this very clear idea that, that they are there to be observed, but you know, from a really safe distance from somewhere else. And, and this is precisely what gave her somehow the pleasure. And, uh, and, and somehow not taking these people as real people, but taking them as imaginary. So you see that the role of the imaginary that is created about this is also one of the major features that, uh, that that provides the, the sublime experience in the real life. So without this kind of imaginary superstructure, you, you would not be able to take pleasure in such a moment. So it always plays with your fantasy and so on. Uh, and the funny thing was that in the end, like she had to sleep in the, in the train station and so on. Uh, and, uh, and then she told me anyway, she was like, but this was the most beautiful day in my life. This was so exciting. I've never experienced anything so exciting in my life. <laughs> and, which might be a bit sad, but 
<laughs> but nonetheless, I think it tells a great deal to this kind of uh, attraction uh, that there is uh, for certain people in this uh, culture. Um, Yeah, and I think that uh, there is another point which I think also uh, goes uh, with, uh, with this kind of sublime experiences and it's of course uh, this kind of self-negation, you know? the kind of potentiality to be destroyed and so on. And you can find it uh, when you read this biker erotica, uh, when you manage to read them, <laughs> you read yourself precisely to that principle. In every single of these books, there is always the, the, the girl who doesn't know, like, should I do this? He's too dangerous, but because he's dangerous, I feel so absolutely attracted and so on. And, and there is always this uh, idea that this will destroy you. No? So the threat of destruction, like if I will be with this guy, I will be totally destroyed, you know? And the men even tell that to these women, no? you're with me, you will be destroyed, you know? I will drag you into hell of crime and violence and so on, and there will, there will be no returning and so on. And the women are like, oh, I know I will be destroyed, but still I have to do it. No? So again, you see the same principle of, of this ideological formation that allows for the pleasure also for the reader, but, uh, but the imaginary real pleasure for the, for the woman as well. Um, and, uh, and then one of the bikers in this kind of novel says, for instance, whatever are you running from to this girl? I'm not a way out. I'm a fucking self-destruct button. And then she says, this is exactly what I want. <laughs> so, so you see this, uh, this, uh, this kind of thing. And, and I think that even in, in classical dramas, you know, like Antigone, no? And you must know Antigone. You have the same thing where, where, where Antigone, you know, is a kind of self-destruct button, right? And she goes and does, does the thing and, and destroys herself anyway. And this is come somehow part of the sublime pleasure you, you, you get, uh, uh, this uh, fr from that uh, from that plane, no? and uh, Lacan, for instance, uh, uh, also uh, pointed out when it comes to this fascination with her character over centuries that it is Antigone herself who fascinates us. Antigone in her unbearable splendor, she has a quality that both attracts us and startles us in the sense of intimidates us. This terrible self-willed victim disturbs us. So in a way you find the same principle in a very high uh, culture, Antigone, and on the other hand uh, you can read any cheap biker erotica and you arrive to the same principle of attraction. Um, and of course the final point I think uh, sorry, uh, would be that of course you have this kind of um, think that you want to participate in that power and, and that you find in anything of this. For instance, even, even like the, the uh, what is this? Okay, I have some. See, here it is self, for instance, the merchandise, the support merchandise, it looks like this and so on. Um, yeah, and or you wear like 81 support shirt and so on, huge. And then you have, for instance, even this is, I think, very interesting, 81 uh, power drink. No? So you basically, uh, I think that it has this magical property uh, where you it's supposed to be transformed. It's not just a regular energy drink. It's an energy drink made by the Hells Angels. And that means that when you drink that drink, you might be, uh, you might take on some of the desirable quality in that, you know? Like you may be, you may be becoming more intimidating. Maybe you you stand a bit stronger and so on. And I, and I think that this, this works in, in very funny ways. It also worked with me, <laughs> like, to use a funny story of transformation, uh, uh, where I was in the US, no? and, and as you might think, like, the US is the most prohibitive place ever. It's a total, I was at the Berkeley campus, Berkeley University. Every tree you go, there is a poster saying like, uh, oh my God, have you been a victim of sexual harassment? Call this number. Are you LGBTQ? And somebody posted a nasty comment. Please contact this person, you know? Then you have the campus police, you know, constantly circling. Then you have the real police around the campus constantly circling. And, and you're in this kind of, you know, smoking, you cannot find cigarettes anywhere. Like I haven't smoked the whole time because you just can't find them. And <laughs> so, so every kind of pleasure is basically prohibited. No? And even this kind of thing you have like when you're in seven o'clock, you know, you're not, you're not supposed to be out alone on the street, you know, especially when you're like the campus faculty. And so you can call this service that, that walks you home and so on. So, so they have people that walk you home because of course, street crime and so on so it's a bit like a environment of like constant like manufacturing of threat and constant securitization at the same time no? 
And so you, and, and of course you have silly laws like you might know, like jaywalking is prohibited, which means like crossing the street there where there is no uh, zebra crossing. No? So when you want to cross the street just somewhere because there's no cars, you can't do that. And if a policeman sees you and they are watching, <laughs> you pay like $200, which is insane. So, so for like crossing the road where you're not supposed to, $200. And I thought like this, and, and I was going crazy because it's always like super far, you know, to cross the road where you're supposed to, and then you have to go back like an idiot. And and then I was going crazy after these two months, you know. And then I met these guys from Oakland, you know, and and and, <laughs> and he's like two Hells Angels. And for the first time, <laughs> we crossed the street. Like I was in between them, you know, crossing the street, and I was so happy. Like it was just like this little transgression was such an enormous pleasure all of a sudden. <laughs> and, and suddenly, like I was walking tall, you know, like between these guys with these jackets, and like I can do it too. I can just like break this stupid rule that makes no fucking sense, you know. And, and I think that, that that is precisely this kind of uh, empowering elements to this kind of destructive characters that, and that's why I think we have certain uh, pleasure and that's what we also consume when we consume things like that and what people do. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's, what, that's the imaginary structure of, of that, that uh, you will get some power out of it for yourself. Um, so I think that uh, would be enough, no? <laughs> I think that makes for a round. <laughs>